mercy and peace from the Lord God Almighty. Amen. We are at war, and we've been at war our entire lives, and we will be at war until we die. While we may not fear bombs bursting in air as do those who live in conflicted regions of the world such as Syria or Ukraine, the fight that we're in is just as real, just as deadly. The warfare is ongoing, it doesn't let up. The fighting goes on day and night 24-7-52. And while it is not fought with rifles or artillery, and while we fear not chemical, biological, nuclear weapons, the weapons that are arrayed against us bring pain, misery, and death, none the less. In our epistle reading for today, St. Paul makes us aware of the battle that we're caught up in. So if you would, please turn to Ephesians 6, where we pick up at verse 10. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now there are two mistakes people make when it comes to spiritual warfare. Either they take it too seriously and they see demons causing mayhem and everything from a dirty house to political intrigue, or they don't take it serious enough and they pray, fall prey to its attacks without ever knowing what hit them. You are at war, but not every sniffle, head cold, or pimple is the result of a demonic attack. You are fighting a life and death battle, but the foe is not so great that he can't be conquered. In fact, the devil and his evil horde have already been beaten by God through the cross of Jesus. For what people saw as the Lord's defeat is actually the source of our victory by God's grace over sin, death, and hell. It's as Paul reminds us, thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't fight against some imaginary boogeyman. The devil's not some scary character in stories we tell children to terrify them into being good. The devil is real. And the devil is quite active, even as St. Peter warns us, be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the whole world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. The battle rages around us, but we fight as those who have confidence that we've already won, because we have in Christ Jesus. It's as Paul tells Timothy, the Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. In your Christian life, you battle against rulers and authorities. That is, the powerful evil forces of fallen angels headed up by Satan. And they are vicious in their attacks. To withstand those attacks, we must depend on God's strength. Use every piece of his armor that he provides for us. Everyone needs body armor as we battle against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. We fight in the strength of the church militant whose power comes from the Holy Spirit. To be strong in the Lord refers to the strength that comes from God rather than trying to tough things out on our own. And note that Paul says be strong, not become strong. You see, by our faith, which the Holy Spirit brings to us through the means of God's word and the holy sacraments, we are continually empowered in the strength of God's might. God's mighty power is a part of the kingdom blessings that are made available to God's people. 
At the very beginning of his letter to the Ephesians, St. Paul offers up this prayer. He says that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saint, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to his working of great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule, authority, power, and dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. The power that raised Christ from the dead empowers God's people as they prepare for the spiritual warfare that they all, we all, will experience on earth. We will need it. For as Paul says, the struggle occurs in a spiritual realm that must be fought with spiritual weapons. And while the victory is certain, the battle must still be fought. Now Paul's imperative covers the full scope of what we do in, in order to engage the enemy. He tells us, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. God empowers his people for the fight. Make sure that they do not go into it unarmed. God gives us a complete set of body armor meant to protect us from our head to toe. This whole armor is for defending oneself as well as carrying out the attack. And it's the same armor that God himself puts on, according to the prophet Isaiah who wrote, he puts on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. You see, we're not just given any old armor. We're given God's. And we need it to stand against the spiritual forces that are arrayed before us. Paul continues in this morning's text saying, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. The war is real, and disciples are encouraged yet a second time to take up the whole armor of God, to put it on and face the evil foe. The armor is ready for us. We merely need to take it. Take up, from its Greek word translated, is a military term describing one's preparation for battle. Back when I was in the army, the commander would tell us to suit up, which meant that you put on everything required for the battle. When you went out on a mission, you never knew what you might be called upon to do. So you took everything. Fully armored up, I could carry anywhere from 75 to 125 pounds of gear. Failure to properly suit up for that operation could render you battle ineffective, and that could cause problems for the whole unit. During the battle in Mogadishu, Somalia in 1993, many of the casualties resulted from soldiers leaving parts of their body armor and other equipment behind because they didn't think the situation would become so dire. Ill-equipped for the battle they actually wound up facing, they were overwhelmed. God's armor is available. We need only to take it and put it on. Suit up! Without it, we'll be unable to withstand the spiritual forces that are lined up against us. And so we now pick up at verse 14 as Paul begins to inventory what God places at our disposal. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. 
The belt was also called a girdle, which held together the under layer of the soldier's clothing, as well as securing the lower part of the breastplate in place, all the while providing a sheath for his sword. It also included a breech clout, or a heavy apron that protected the lower abdomen. Just as the belt formed the foundation of the soldier's armor, the truth is the foundation of the Christian life. And that refers to the truth of God's word that points us to Jesus who himself is, the way and the truth and the life. If we were not sure of Jesus being truth, there'd be no need for armor or even attempting to fight this battle. But God's truth, as revealed to us through Jesus Christ, sets the foundation for victory. Recall what the devil says about the, what the, Jesus says about the devil when he confronts the religious types. You are of your father the devil, he said to them, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Remember that as Jesus was praying for his followers in the garden before his arrest, he asked God to sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. The next article of armor a soldier would put on would be the breastplate a large leather, bronze, or chain mail piece that protected the body from the soldier's neck down to his thighs. It gave protection to his vital, arm, uh, vital body parts, so that made it important. And it also had a back piece, too, that would protect his blow, from blows from behind. No soldier would dare go into battle without their breastplate. Well, the breastplate of righteousness is made of God's righteousness covering our sin, guilt, and shame. As we heard from God's word last week, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Remember that the enemy, Satan, the accuser, as he's identified in Revelation chapter 12, tries to convince us that we're not really saved because we're not good enough and we constantly fail God. And he's right. But God, in his grace and mercy, elects to claim us as his own. You see, we're not wearing our righteousness, which basically doesn't exist. We wear his as we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. A Roman soldier also wore special footwear that protected his feet while not slowing him down. The shoes were often made of soft leather and had studded soles for extra traction. Well, likewise, Jesus' followers need special shoes that make them ready with the good news of peace, the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, which guards your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. With that true peace, that only God's word can give us. Inner peace is produced within our hearts. We know we belong to God because of the atoning work of Jesus, and that makes us ready to charge into battle. The shield of faith refers to a soldier's shield they carried into battle for protection from arrows and spears. A Roman shield was a large oblong piece. It was four foot high by two foot wide, made of wood and leather, and had an iron frame. This shield for the Christian is to be our faith, our complete reliance on God. We depend on God, and because of his love for us on the cross, we try to do his will as best we can. We are those who, by God's power, are being guarded by faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Thus, when the enemy sends his flaming arrows of temptation and doubt, wrath, lust, despair, vengeance, problems, and trials into our lives, we can raise our shields and we can extinguish them. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world, says St. John. 
And this is the victory that overcomes the world. Our faith. Take the helmet of salvation. For a helmet protects a soldier's head. Paul, elsewhere, tells believers to put on for a helmet the hope of salvation. Now Christians understand that our hope is not a wish upon a star, but a certainty that God will do all that he promises to do. Our salvation is already accomplished by Jesus' sacrifice on the cross for us. This salvation protects our minds from the devil's attacks. When the devil seeks to lead us astray to doubt God's saving love, our salvation rests at the cross where God proves once and for all, I love you. You are mine. And we trust him at his word. Hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts and we understand that salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believe. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. A Roman soldier carried a short sword, the only weapon used for attack here listed by Paul. The sword was used to thrust its blade into an enemy to slash away through its defenses. And God's word is pictured as such a weapon of attack in Hebrews where the writer tells us that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul, of spirit, of joints, and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. As the devil attacks us in the same manner with which he attacked Jesus in his wilderness temptations, we can counterattack, as did our Lord who turned to the devil, looked him in the eye, and said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. The battle cry has sounded. The war cry has been raised. The struggle is now engaged. But the victory is already ours through Jesus Christ. So, suit up. Fight the good fight that lies before you with that whole armor of God that he has given to us all by his grace. For the victory is already ours, though the battle must still be fought under the banner of our captain and our Lord Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.